meeting. Uh, so should we be doing that? Um, are you asking me? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, anyone. Okay, I think someone has started the recording, so maybe I'll okay. just go along with it. All right, yeah, I'm not looking back now. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, our speaker today, uh, Neildra Mishra, is a Sri Madhi Amba and Sri B.S. Shastri Chair, Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering in IIT Gandhinagar. Uh, in 2007, she completed her bachelor's in uh, bachelor's in science in uh, three majors: computer science, mathematics, and statistics, from from Mount Carmel College in Bangalore. Then she pursued an integrated PhD in uh, theoretical computer science from the Institute for Mathematical Sciences (IMSc) in Chennai. After graduating from IMSc in uh, 2012, uh, she spent the next three years uh, at the Department of Computer Science and Automation at our very own uh, Indian Institute of Science, first as a research associate and then as an Inspire faculty fellow. Professor Misra's research interests include uh, the interplay of structural graph theory and graph algorithms, tools and techniques in uh, parameterized complexity, computational perspectives on uh, combinatorial games, voting mechanisms with a special focus on strategic behavior and fair allocation of resources. Uh, on behalf of everyone, I heartily welcome Professor Misra to our IAC MSR seminar series. Over to you, Professor. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for your kind information. I don't know where you dug all that up, but uh, thanks again. And um, all right, so I'm going to get started um, and talk about parameterized approaches to Kemeny rank aggregation, which is one of my favorite voting methods. And um, I think uh, this may be slightly different from what was advertised in the abstract in terms of the proportion of time that I will spend on um, stuff that's very classical versus stuff that's recent. I just realized once I started digging things up, I found a few fun proofs. I think I'll be presenting a couple of things that are kind of old, uh, but will hopefully uh, still be entertaining nonetheless and provide some context. So let's see how this goes. So the rough plan is to, uh, you know, uh, give you some background, tell you what the problem is about, um, and talk about some foundational results that kind of set the tone and motivate uh, the need for looking at uh, parameterized approaches um, and also approximation algorithms along the way. And um, so we're going to look at, um, again, like I said, a classical uh, NP hardness result a little bit um, uh, because it's just uh, impressive that that this is, a, is an aggregation mechanism that turns out to be hard, even when there are just a constant number of voters involved. And uh, it's it's not a crazy constant, it's just four voters. So, uh, so I thought that's pretty cool. So I'll tell you a little bit about that and its connection with, um, uh, again, a classical graph theory problem, um, a graph algorithms problem called feedback arc set on tournaments, uh, so that's that's a fun connection to explore as well. And again, a lot has happened um, in that space um, in the recent past, but I'll tell you about uh, stuff that's a little more textbook material by now, uh, but was uh, uh, was pretty cool at the time uh, it came out. Um, and um, I, I think it's again a fun, fun technique to uh, see in case you haven't seen it before. It's called chromatic coding and still useful um, for um, you know, for for problems that that involve uh, uh, for solutions that involve subsets of edges and graphs. So, so we'll take a look at that a little bit, and then I want to segue into this recent notion of finding diverse solutions. Um, unfortunately, the word diverse is. Uh, kind of over overloaded a little bit in the literature right now. So it may not be what, what you're thinking when like when you think about diversity, um, there's probably a few few notions that come to mind already. And this may be a little bit different uh, from, from what comes to mind by default, but tell you a little bit about um, some recent work that came out, um, which is about finding diverse uh, solutions to the Kemeny aggregation problem. So that's kind of the plan. So um, right. So what we uh, what we are looking at is um, you know this is rank aggregation. So what you have is a collection of rankings over a fixed set of alternatives. Uh, of course, when 
I say rankings, I'm thinking about strict linear orders, but you could generalize this to partial orders or weak orders, allow for ties and things like that. But just for simplicity, yeah, I'll stick to rankings, yeah. And um, what do you want to output is um, a single consensus ranking. So again, for now, we will focus on the setting where we want to output a single ranking, and then we'll come back to uh, when we talk about diversity, we'll kind of generalize this a little bit. But for now, the uh, the goal is to output a single consensus ranking. And of course, that raises the question of what is a consensus ranking? So let's just look at an example. And I hope you've had breakfast, otherwise this might make you hungry. But uh, let's just say that these are food preferences, so five different people. Um, and the rankings are such that the leftmost object is the most preferred one. So the first person, for instance, likes pizza over burger, over cake, over donut, over tacos, and so on and so forth, right? So suppose you're given a bunch of rankings like this. What does it mean uh, to output something that's a consensus ranking? Well, uh, before we define what we mean by a consensus ranking, uh, maybe I can hint to uh, some properties that you might want intuitively a consensus ranking to satisfy. So for instance, it might stand out to you that everybody positions the donut at the fourth place. So it may not be unreasonable to want a consensus ranking to also somehow respect this because it seems like everybody agrees that um, donut seems to be the, the fourth um, the fourth most liked food item among these five, uh, that, that could be something that, that you would like to propose. Um, and here's another thing that's probably not as obvious, but what I highlighted, uh, you might notice that everybody uh, prefers, uh, uh, prefers a cake over a donut, right? Um, I'm sorry if that's not your that's not your take on this and you can also see that there are varying degrees for some of them it's touch and go and for some of them they prefer the cake very much more than the donut uh, but nonetheless everybody prefers uh, the cake more than the donut so it would be surprising if a consensus ranking decided to not uh, respect this right so uh, so this is um, uh, this is a property that's called unanimity if everybody agrees on something then the consensus must agree with that agreement so almost everybody will agree that you would want your ranking to satisfy unanimity uh, but of course that's not the only property that you might want your consensus ranking to satisfy uh, you might want it to satisfy a bunch of other equally natural and innocent sounding properties and this is sort of the axiomatic approach to um, identifying what we mean by uh, a desirable consensus ranking. And um, of course, if you just wanted unanimity, it's not very difficult to come up with a ranking which is unanimous in particular. You could pick any of the input rankings and that would be a unanimous ranking. And this is uh, in the spirit of a dictatorship where right? you just go with what one of the voters is saying. Uh, so a dictatorial rule is unanimous, but it's not a very interesting uh, it's not a very interesting rule. It's arguably also not a very desirable rule. And it turns out that once you pile on your axioms and desirable properties, very soon uh, you encounter a whole bunch of impossibility results or non-existence results, which basically tell you that you may not be able to ever find a ranking that satisfies all of these properties. So the axiomatic approach crashes rather early. And um, not sure if there was a question, let me just double check the chat, maybe not, okay. So um, yeah, of course, please feel free to interrupt me if I'm saying something stupid or not making sense. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat every so often, but please also feel free to just uh, unmute yourselves whenever you like. All right, so, um, so as I was saying, the axiomatic approach to defining the notion of a consensus ranking gate crashes pretty quickly because you encounter non-existence and one approach that people have taken to defining consensus rankings is to say, well, what's the ranking that's as close as you can be to satisfying certain classes of, uh, you know, axioms that you might want to, that you might be interested in. So that's sort of one approach, and that's not the approach that we will be taking. Uh, we'll be taking a slightly different approach where we want to find a ranking that minimizes uh, some concept of dissatisfaction 
um, among um, among the people who are involved here, right? So what does it mean again to minimize dissatisfaction? So let's go back to our example. We have a bunch of rankings here. And let's say we just propose a consensus ranking, right? And we want to think about, you know, how satisfied is everybody with this, with this proposal, right? So so we ask everybody, well, you know, how what do you feel about this ranking, right? And this prompts this idea that you probably need some sort of a distance between rankings. You need to be able to evaluate, uh, you know, if, if I have a certain ranking in mind and you propose a certain ranking that's that's going to be, uh, that, that we're going to call the societal ranking or the consensus ranking, how do I feel about this? Probably need a way to measure uh, how I feel about a given ranking versus my own. Right. So, um, so again, there are uh, probably a bazillion different notions of distances between permutations. The one that we are going to consider is the so-called uh, Kendall Tau distance or the pairwise um, uh, descent distance. So here's how this is defined. You essentially consider pairs of candidates and you ask yourself, well, what are the pairs that the, the two permutations agree on and what are the pairs that they disagree on? So for example, between the cake and the pizza, both of these permutations feel that the cake um, is superior to pizza. And that's the same with the cake and the burger and the cake and the donut. But when it comes to uh, cake versus tacos, the permutations disagree. Okay, and you could do this for every pair of candidates in question and you'll find that in this example, there are five pairs of alternatives, assuming I haven't made any mistakes here. There are five pairs of alternatives on which these permutations do not disagree, uh, do, do not agree. So, so that's going to be our notion uh, of distance, at least for total orders. I think this satisfies uh, the traditional properties that you would want a distance function to satisfy. Uh, this is not the case if you were dealing with uh, partial orders, but you know that's something that we can live with. So, um, so essentially what we want to do is come up with a single ranking that minimizes the total Kendall Tau distance from all the input rankings. Uh, this is also called the bubble sort distance because you can imagine that, uh, you know, if you think of the ranking on the top as some sort of an idealized sorted order, then uh, this distance is exactly the number of uh, swaps that bubble sort would have to perform if it had to transform the ranking at the bottom to the one that's on the top. So that's why it's also sometimes called the bubble sort distance. And this um, notion of finding a ranking that minimizes uh, this distance, indeed a justification for this notion of distance, I think was uh, was given by Kemeny back in the day. And I think uh, this is an intriguing um, paper titled Mathematics Without Numbers. And um, you know it's, it's a nice read uh, if you want to take a look at uh, the backstory of how this notion of distance is justified and so on. I'll not get into it very much more. Uh, but what is interesting is that determining such a ranking that minimizes uh, the, the, the total bubble sort distance from all the votes is, um, it turns out to be NP hard, and this was known way back in 1989 already. But in 2001, there was a strengthening of this NP hardness proof, which showed that this is actually hard even for just for voters, which has implications when you start looking at it from the parameterized perspective. So in particular, it does not make sense to parameterize this problem by the number of voters because it's already hard when the number of voters is a constant. Um, and again, we'll talk about the kind of parameterizations that this problem has been subjected to in just a bit. Uh, but before that, I want to um, just show you a glimpse of how this NP-hardness result works because it's, I think, really curious uh, that that's something uh, should be hard in such a in such a strong way. Um, oh, sorry. It looks like. I thought that I got disconnected, but that was from the Teams app. I'm so sorry. So I kind of freaked out a little and tried to rejoin, but apparently I didn't need to. Uh, what I wanted to do is um, just check if there were any questions up to this point about any of the definitions. Um, and I'll just pause for like maybe 30 seconds here, just in case there are any questions.
Okay, there's a relief slab. Um, at least I think I didn't lose the connection in the interim there. Okay, good. So um, yeah, and since there are no questions, I think I'll move on and uh, maybe tell you a little bit about um, um, about this NP hardness result, which basically says that um, even if you have just four voters, uh, the problem of computing uh, this sort of a consensus ranking based on this notion of distance turns out to be hard. Okay. And uh, this reduction is from a problem called minimum feedback edge set. Um, and um, well, of course, minimum feedback edge set just on undirected graphs is, is actually not even hard because um, so, what, okay, so, so maybe I should first define what I mean by a minimum feedback edge set. It's the, it's the smallest number of edges that you need to remove for your graph to be cyclic. And uh, if you have an undirected graph, then uh, you sort of know that once you have removed your feedback edge set, uh, you must be left with some sort of a spanning forest. So that's really all that you need to do. So this is uh, this is not a challenging problem as it turns out, but it does become NP-complete when you restrict your attention to directed graphs. And um, this is the problem that we will be reducing from. So just as an example, uh, in this graph, there are perhaps three uh, cycles in the underlying undirected graph, but the directed graph just has uh, this one. If um, assuming I've checked this correctly, there's just this one uh, directed cycle, and therefore you could you could get rid of it by removing just that one edge, and this is now a DAG. So um, so this is what you want to reduce from, and um, you know I'm not okay. So so just as a disclaimer at this point, I won't be giving you the sort of the complete argument for uh, for the reduction, but just enough to sort of give you a flavor because it turns out um, that that um, uh, the Kemeny rank aggregation problem has um, relationship that, that uh, KRA shares with these um, graph problems that have to do with acyclicity. So I'll just try to convey a flavor of what's going on here. So the first thing we do is basically subdivide every edge. This is um, this makes things convenient and it doesn't change anything as far as the solution size is concerned. So now we have all of these blue vertices which have in degree one and out degree one. And uh, what you do from here is I'm going to do this boring thing of labeling all the vertices so that I can refer to them. And I initially had this idea of color coding all the vertices, but turned out that I ran out of colors. So now there's just one that I've left in there um, just so that I can um, you know, draw your attention to it if I need to. But based on this graph here, uh, where basically all we have done is we've subdivided every edge in, in the original feedback edge set instance, uh, what we are going to do is come up with four rankings um, which have uh, uh, which admit a solution of a certain size, if and only if you can get rid of all cycles with a certain cost here. So that's the agenda. So what we're going to do is basically go through the vertices in order. And uh, so this ordering is arbitrary. You can, you can name the original vertices you like from let's say one to N. And then uh, of course I've used letters here, but you, know, you, can, you can name the remaining vertices from N plus one to N plus N. And what we're going to do is basically start off with the original vertices and start listing out uh, to begin in, in the first ranking, we're going to start listing out the out neighbors. So one has no out neighbors, two has A, three has B and D, um, and so on. Um, oops. So for some reason, okay, I think. Okay, I think that, sorry about that. I think that there was probably an interim slide that was out of place. Uh, but yeah, basically uh, what we are doing here is enumerating all the original vertices and we are placing their out neighbors right next to them. Uh, at the moment in an arbitrary order, I'm just following the alphabetical order here. And this may look a bit arbitrary. So we'll get rid of that arbitrariness in a moment. Um, so this is the first ranking. And the second one, we do something similar. Um, except that now we list the in neighbors again in an arbitrary order. So, uh, so we have uh, one followed by A and B and two followed by C and so on and so forth. So you can sort of trust me about this is the in neighbor ordering for all the vertices. 
Um, and now let me just put these two rankings side by side. Um, at the moment, um, okay, I don't know if there's a whole lot of intuition in this example, uh, but what you might imagine is that if the original graph happened to be acyclic, and if you had a topological sort on the original vertices, then one of these would completely align um, and, and would actually be in complete agreement with a topological sort being proposed as the consensus ranking, and the other one would have a certain amount of disagreement with a whole bunch of back edges going around. That's, um, that's a little bit of a rough intuition, but of course, it's not super helpful because um, first of all, we don't necessarily have uh, a cyclic graph coming in. That's kind of the whole point. And besides, uh, therefore, we have no idea about uh, topological sort. Presumably, we want to be thinking about a topological sort once the feedback edge set is removed from the original graph. But we have no way of anticipating what that topological sort will look like. So basically, to, uh, to make sure that, that, that we can actually work with uh, no matter what topological sort is thrown at us, we need to get rid of the arbitrariness of choosing this order on the original vertices, which well, was just completely arbitrary to begin with. Um, and that's, that's where the other two rankings come in. So what we are going to do is, um, what we're going to do is essentially take the two rankings that we came up with and more or less reverse them. Uh, we're not exactly reversing them in the sense that, well, I mean, for instance, in particular, if you reversed the first ranking that we came up with here, you would start with the vertex I and then eight and H. It's not quite what we are doing. We're reversing them in groups. So what we're doing is we are taking uh, the, the group of vertices corresponding to the last vertex first, and then uh, we're putting in the vertex first, and then we are taking the list of its out neighbors and reversing that list. That's what we are doing. So, so it's more or less taking the ranking and turning it uh, backwards or upside down, but it's just doing it a little bit carefully um, for, uh, you know, for, for reasons that Okay, so, so would it quite work the way that you hoped if you simply reverse the whole list? <laughs> this is something uh, that, that I have checked at some point, but the slightly nuanced way of reversing the list basically has, um, it has a neat uh, sort of a cancellation effect. So, so basically the idea is that if you have two rankings which are polar opposites of each other, so you have a ranking and you have its reverse, then it turns out that any other ranking uh, will have a combined Kemeny score of n choose two from these two rankings when considered together, right? So n is the number of objects that you're ranking here. So for example, suppose you have um, one through eight and eight through one, uh, let's just consider any other ranking, uh, just fix any pair you like. So for instance, seven and three, if this intermediate ranking ranks seven ahead of three, it's going to be in agreement with one of the rankings, but then just practically by uh, the way the other ranking is constructed, it has to experience a disagreement with the other ranking. So any pair of objects contributes a Kemeny score of exactly one. It must in fact agree with one of the rankings and it must disagree with the other. So it turns out that with the construction that we just saw, uh, there's a Kemeny score of um, two times n choose two plus two times m choose two plus two m is completely unavoidable. So if you go back here and just look at the way the original vertices and the blue vertices are positioned, you can already anticipate that a score of two times n choose two and two times m choose two is, is completely unavoidable. There are n black vertices and m blue vertices. And the two M sort of comes from the interaction between the black and the blue vertices, the way they are, uh, that, that forces the Kemeny score of at least two M. So what this sort of yeah, careful reversal of the original lists has done for you is that it's kind of taken away the arbitrariness of the initial ordering. It's forced a certain Kemeny score on any ranking. And now it turns out that if, for example, your graph was acyclic to begin with, then if you proposed the topological sort as a consensus ranking, then it would actually have this exact Kemeny score. It wouldn't have, um, it, it wouldn't have any more suffering beyond what was the bare minimum. On the other hand, if you had a feedback 
uh, edge set of size at most k, you can imagine that you have the topological sort and all the edges in the feedback edge set are like these back edges that are going against uh, the flow. Um, uh, and, and it turns out that the way those edges manifest in terms of like the Kemeny uh, disagreements um, uh, is, is like exactly a um, fixed function of K. In fact, it turns out that, that each of these back edges uh, contribute a Kemeny score of two. Uh, so that's essentially uh, how you would argue the forward direction. You say that you take the, uh, you take the feedback edge set you delete these edges, look at the topological sort um, that, that from the resulting uh, from the resulting graph, look at the topological sort and all the vertices. And uh, you can sort of argue that, that this is exactly the Kemeny score that you're going to get uh, from this consensus ranking. And uh, the other way it turns out that any, uh, any sort that, that you propose, uh, you can interpret it as a sorting of the vertices and the number of back edges will, again, the, the correspondence between the back edges and um, the, the disagreements in these rankings um, is, it turns out to be pretty clean. So, uh, so the reverse direction works out in pretty much the same spirit. So I'm not going to belabor the details anymore here, but uh, happy to talk about it more if you'd like to sort of pause and take a closer look. Uh, but this is this is sort of how you manage to show that uh, computing the Kemeny score is hard, even when there are just four voters um, in uh, in the picture. Okay, so now let me try and make sure that my slides are ordered properly. Okay, yeah. So I think I wanted to tell you a little more about um, uh, about the progress on computing the optimal Kemeny score. So it turns out that uh, so if you remember this. Strengthening of the NP hardness result was back in 2001, and um, there have been a couple of constant factor approximations since, which typically have relied on um, mostly LP methods. There have been a couple of combinatorial algorithms as well. Uh, some of them have been in the spirit of generalized sorting algorithms, and uh, there are the quite a few elegant approaches out there. So, uh, so there's an 11 by 7 approximation algorithm um, uh, that was randomized in 2005, and then there was an 8 over 5 approximation. Uh, this, I think, was the, was the combinatorial one, um, and, and this was uh, deterministic, um, if I remember correctly. Um, and then there was a PTAS um, in 2007. Uh, the PTAS was originally proposed for feedback offset on tournaments. Um, but notice that it's the weighted feedback offset on tournaments, which means that that's actually equivalent to Kemeny rank aggregation, as we will see in a moment. And of course, I promised to talk about parameterized approaches. So these have been mostly um, uh, mostly the approximation line of work that, that I've talked about so far. So, um, so the, the parameterized scene has also been fairly active with respect to this, this problem. So just a quick recap of the terminology in a uh, parameterized. Uh, yeah. Just a minute, Professor, before we go on to the parameterized stuff, like there is a question in the chat box. Do you wish to take it now or perhaps at the end of the talk? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so is all rank aggregation hard or just the axiomatic approach that I described? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I think, um, yeah, the hardness that I'm talking about is definitely specific to uh, the Kemeny method uh, or the, the, the proposal that we want a ranking that minimizes the total uh, Kendall Tau distance from all the votes. Uh, you can imagine that you could work with different notions of distance. Uh, so there are many other distances between permutations that could be considered. Um, if memory serves right, most of these methods do turn out to be intractable. Um, I guess you could also, um, like like I said, not, not think about distances at all. And uh, sort of, so for instance, um, uh, in, in, ter in an axiomatic sense, one of the things that's considered to be very desirable is finding a Condorcet consistent ranking or finding a Condorcet winner, which is, so a Condorcet winner is a winner that beats every other candidate in pairwise elections. So if you just, uh, if you just constrain the, the, the rankings to, um, to this candidate and any other candidate, they have, uh, you know, that they have a majority in, in that restricted election. 
Uh, the thing about condo saver notes is that they, they may not exist. So, but if they did, then you could sort of say, okay, I'll pick out the condo saver and rank him first in the consensus ranking. That seems like a very reasonable thing to do and just repeat the process. Um, so I think uh, there is a, there is a ranking notion which says that, okay, if you can't find a condor say winner, then what is the nearest collection of rankings, which does have a condor say winner? And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be, um, that's going to give you some, some concept of a score. So, um, so as I said, for the axiomatic approaches that seem to lead to dead ends, uh, you could adapt them to say, well, what is the what is the best we can do in that context? But as far as I know, most of these approaches also turn out to be hard. But I'm not aware of a meta theorem which says that any reasonable aggregation method that you propose is going to be computationally intractable. As far as I know, uh, there is there is no result like that. But most of the individual methods that I can think of do turn out to be intractable. But the one that I specifically talked about was was certainly just um, limited to Kemeny aggregation. So I hope that addresses the question, makes sense. Um, but let me know if you have uh, any follow-up remarks there. There seems to be another question as well from Rahul Madhavan. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh, yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know, uh, the approximation algorithms that you spoke about, uh, they are mm -hmm. approximate in which uh, parameter? Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Good point. So the, they're all approximate in the in the Kemeny score. They're all trying to approximate this. Um, yeah. The, the total um, the total distance from from all the rankings. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Understand. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. All right. So. Um, if there aren't um, any more questions, then maybe um, uh, is is it okay to move on? You think? Yes, I guess we can move on. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So um, yeah, right. So so I think I uh, promised to talk about some parameterized approaches. So um, so as, as we uh, as we just said. A natural uh, parameter that you think about is the um, is the solution that you're after. Uh, but before I talk about that, let me just just in case the parameterized framework uh, is something that you haven't seen before. I'll just uh, it's a good time to slip in some terminology. So, typically, a parameterized problem is um, is different from a classical problem, and just in the sense that you you have the the input as is usual in a classical problem, but you also have a parameter that tags along with it, and your your algorithms are evaluated in terms of their performance um, uh, seen from the view of this parameter. So it's it's a more fine grained um, uh, approach to uh, to evaluating the complexity of your algorithm. So if you can get an algorithm where you can divorce the running time of the parameter from the size of the input. And our typical worldview is that the parameter is nice and small. The input is terribly large. So we want something that's polynomial or efficient when it comes to input size, um, but is allowed to be um, is allowed to be expensive when um, in terms of the parameter. So um, so these kinds of running times, um, f of k times poly n, are called fixed parameter tractable algorithms. You could argue that. Even if it's n to the f of k, uh, that's that's also uh, a polynomial when the parameter is, for instance, a constant. Uh, such algorithms are called XP algorithms, um, and they are they're not considered as nice because notice that the degree of the polynomial varies with the parameter, and that's uh, whereas here you have a uniform polynomial bound. Um, and hopefully the f of k running time is uh, just something you can brush off in practice if, if k is small and f is manageable. So that's usually the goal. Um, and the parameterized framework has also been useful for understanding pre-processing algorithms, which have mostly existed in the form of heuristics and such. But once you have this parameterized approach to problem solving. Now you can talk about, uh, you can actually measure how, how good a heuristic is by asking if the, the, the heuristic manageably brings down the, the size of the instance. So the goal with the kernelization algorithm is 
to run in polynomial time. And you're not necessarily looking to solve the problem, but you're just trying to reduce the problem or compress it to something that is of manageable size. And um, in this case, f of k can potentially be a polynomial function of k. And if you manage to get to that point, then you have on your hands what we call a polynomial kernel. And that's kind of the holy grail of efficiency in the context of kernelization. Uh, but there's also like a hardness framework, which tells you when not to expect polynomial kernels. And there've been some relatively recent developments um, that, that talk about what's the next best thing that you can do when you don't expect polynomial kernels. And uh, there have been a few attempts at um, sort of addressing that question. Uh, but I think the most successful one uh, to date appears to be what is called lossy kernelization, which combines ideas from, again, approximation algorithms and puts them in the kernelization framework. So that's, uh, uh, that's definitely a pretty exciting set of fairly recent developments worth watching out for. And there's a bunch of nice talks about lossy kernels on YouTube in case anyone's interested. All right, so Kemeny aggregation has been subjected to a lot of different uh, parameters. The most uh, natural ones would appear to be the number of voters and the number of candidates. Um, and you could also think about the Kemeny score, which is the solution size. Um, folks have also looked at things like the maximum range of candidate positions, which is to say, you look at like the, the lowest that somebody is ranked and the highest that somebody is ranked. So you fix a candidate. And uh, so let's say I have been ranked at the fifth position um, in, the, in the worst case, the second position in the best case, and everybody ranks me somewhere within this range. So the size of that range um, uh, for one candidate is the range of that candidate. And for the whole instance, you just max it over all candidates. So that's the maximum range. So, um, so this is a, this is a well-motivated parameter for, um, for classes of rankings that are likely to be kind of homogeneous, which is to say that people tend to have similar opinions. Um, about um, about the alternatives, then you would expect that the range doesn't fluctuate too much. Like most people have sort of a natural uh, place and there's a bit of a, you could think of it as like most rankings being a little bit of noise sprinkled on top of that natural position. Um, of course, there's a more formal way in which you could think about um, the votes essentially being generated by some noise model, but that's um, sort of a section of the literature that I'm not terribly familiar with, but I hear that the, the Kemeny aggregation method uh, has a very natural interpretation in that setting as well. So, uh, so once again, if somebody is uh, intrigued by that, that's definitely worth checking out. So you could look at the maximum range or the average range, and you could also look at the, 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 the Kendall tau distances that are built into the instance. So you could look at the, the distances that the rankings have between them. And again, you could average them out or look at the maximum distance and you could treat those as parameters. And um, I think uh, pretty much all of these have been studied as we already know, um, uh, this problem is hard when uh, the number of voters is even fixed. So that's not a very useful parameterization. And I think it turns out that it's also hard for the average range, but with respect to everything else, the problem uh, turns out to be FPT. And um, yeah, there, there are some, um, uh, there are a lot of nice combinatorial ideas that go into many of these FPT algorithms. And there's also a bunch of uh, kernelization based approaches. That's again, uh, quite nice and just leverages um, uh, properties of um, uh, structural properties of the rankings. But I do want to uh, sort of, uh, again, segue a bit into uh, the feedback arcs that on tournaments problems is this cheekily titled paper um, in ICAL back in 2009 called Fast Fast. Uh, the first fast is like the English adjective and the second fast is feedback arcs set on tournaments. And this paper introduced, uh, as far as I remember, the method of chromatic coding, which was a spin-off on uh, the now classical method of color coding. Um, and it led to some really nice running times in particular I think it led to the first sub-exponential algorithm uh, for the problem. But of course, then I think um, some improvements started rolling in. So in 2010, Isaac, that was faster, fast, essentially, and um, along with other problems as well. Um, and there have been a few updates since. I'm not 
like my aim is not to make this comprehensive here, but I would like to tell you a little bit about what is FAST doing in a talk about Chemney rank aggregation. So, um, so the, the relationship is actually, again, fairly transparent. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So FAST is a problem about tournaments, simply complete directed graphs. Uh, it's a complete graph where every edge has an orientation. Um, and um, yeah, we, we will come to the weighted version of the problem, but for now you could imagine that all the edges are unweighted. Um, and of course, tournaments could have cycles in them. Um, our goal with the tournament, so imagine that this tournament is built out of, you know, let's say uh, N players who have all uh, played with each other in some round robin fashion. So everybody has faced off with everyone else and these are the outcomes of the matches. And one thing that we want to do as humans is to sort of rank people according to, let's say, their competence or whatever. So let's say that this is a particular ranking of the vertices in their previous picture. And this is just the edges being redrawn. You can probably quickly tell that this is not the entire graph because uh, it was a complete graph and the degrees here are falling short quite a bit. So these are all the forward edges with respect to this ranking. And you could imagine that these, um, these edges sort of are consistent with your experience of what you would expect, right? In the sense that um, if A defeats B, um, then you would want A to be ranked higher up than B. Okay, so assuming that the, uh, the vertices on the left are the higher ranked uh, players or candidates, uh, these are the edges that that are nice and that are consistent with your claimed ranking. But on the other hand, you also have these annoying back edges, which basically are reflective of what you might think of as upsets where your ranking claims that A is better than B, but it turns out that B beats A when they actually played a match together, right? So of course you're interested in finding a ranking that minimizes these upsets, minimizes the, the number of back edges uh, that you have. So, uh, so this is the natural optimization problem that you might be interested in. You could think of it as either the problem of coming up with a permutation of the vertices of the tournament where the number of back edges is minimized, or you could think of it as the problem of deleting at most K arcs so that the remaining tournament is acyclic. And um, again, a natural parameterization is by K and there's actually a simple, um, okay, so let me first actually tell you about the connection with the with the Kemeny rank aggregation problem. So, back to our example where we are trying to figure out what's a good consensus ranking here. You can imagine getting a tournament out of this picture on the alternatives that are considered here uh, with the following sort of edges. And now the edges have weights on them and your goal is to, again, find uh, an ordering of the vertices so that the total weight of all the back edges is minimized. So it's the natural generalization to uh, the weighted version of the problem. And um, what we want to say here is fairly intuitive. What we want to say is that, for instance, okay, let's fix our attention on the burger and the pizza. It turns out that there's only one person who thinks that the burger is better than the pizza. That's the, that's the fourth person from the top. Everybody else thinks that uh, pizza is favorable to a burger, okay? So what do you want to say is, uh, well, okay, if you rank a burger higher than a pizza, then you're going to get yourself a back edge, which has weight four, because that's how many people you're annoying by making that choice. Uh, but if you do it the other way, you only get a back edge that has weight one. And notice that if you have a unanimous pair, then you only have one of these two edges, not both. So that's because one of them, uh, one of the orderings actually, um, you know, you, you get it for free because everybody agrees there's no, uh, there's no back edge to tell you that you, you upset some people, right? So that's the sort of tournament that you can build out of the ranking. And now you can ask yourself for, you know, weighted feedback offset here. And that actually ends up giving you uh, the optimal um, Chemney ranking. So, uh, so that's the relationship between, uh, so you might as well be talking about weighted fast. That's, uh, that solves uh, in particular Chemney rank aggregation for you. Um, this also has like a fairly clean LP formulation, which is pretty much uh, the same idea. You have these, uh, Boolean variables X, A, B, which tell you if A is ranked ahead of B or not. It's 
Um, and and the first uh, the the first constraint here, well, actually uh, the constraint labeled four, uh, is uh, is the one that tells you that either A is ahead of B or B is ahead of A, and the QAB and the QBAs that you see in the in the optimization objective are precisely the number of people that you annoy when uh, you rank them one way or the other. And the final constraint kind of forces some kind of uh, transitivity to make sure that what you end up with, like the collection of pairs that is set to one actually correspond to a ranking. And it's not just some uh, arbitrary thing. So uh, so whether you look at it from the ILB perspective or the perspective of the reduction, um, weighted fast and Kemeny rank aggregations, essentially the same thing. Um, Okay, I see that I probably don't have more than 10, 15 minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to skip through. Um, okay, I meant to talk a little bit about uh, about chromatic coding, uh, but for that I would have to convince you about like a few nitty gritty details here. Um, mainly that, okay, the, the first observation is that it turns out that you can actually focus on feedback offset by reversals. Um, as opposed to deletions. This is a bit surprising because reversals feel like a weaker operation compared to deletions, but it turns out that they're exactly the same. The advantage with working with reversals, where you're asking are there K arcs that can be reversed to make the tournament acyclic, uh, is that when you perform your reversals, you still maintain a tournament structure, which turns out to be useful um, in, in various uh, contexts when you're doing when you're doing stuff in your algorithms, right? And um, the the main idea of uh, so let me just uh, skip ahead a little bit. Um, this um, yeah I think there's there's an easy observation that a tournament has a cycle if and only if it has a triangle, and that's the that's the argument that I just skipped through. And so there's a simple branch and bound algorithm that that gives you like a three to the k kind of a running time, immediately telling you that the problem is SPT, but um, but it turns out that you can do better with, um, yeah, you, it turns out that you can do better with this randomized technique called chromatic coding, where the idea is to uh, sort of randomly partition the vertices in the hope that all the edges that are supposed to go into your solution kind of cut across this partition. And it turns out that a random partition actually has this property with a decent enough probability that sub-exponentially many repetitions of this make this, uh, uh, make this a randomized algorithm with like constant error probability. So that's uh, that's kind of the key technical statement that, that needs to be uh, established. But once you have a partition that has this property that all your edges go across, it turns out that each part must induce a sub-tournament on its own right because you're, you, you have no degree of freedom there. You're not allowed to reverse any of the edges there. So each part must induce a tournament on its own right. And with that structure, it turns out that you can, um, you can figure out the final solution using, um, uh, using dynamic programming. If you look at the dynamic programming on its own right, uh, it will appear to be expensive. So to get it all down to a nice sub-exponential FPT algorithm, you need to combine this with a kernelization algorithm as well. So there are a few different ingredients, but it turns out that they piece together uh, really nicely to give you uh, to give you these nice sub-exponential algorithms. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to sort of get into the details of that. I want to step back for a moment and talk about um, this question of diverse solutions that I said has come up recently. So just, um, uh, just to back up a bit, we often talk about decision problems where we're looking for whether there is at least one solution. And of course, there's search problems where we want to find these solutions. There are counting problems where we want to count all the solutions. And then there are enumeration problems where we want to literally enlist all these solutions. So these are the typical kinds of questions that we ask ourselves in the context of optimization problems. But more recently, um, uh, uh, folks have started talking about diverse, well, I think I meant to say solutions here, but yeah, let's just say diverse, like the problem of finding diverse solutions. So again, informally, the, the spirit in which you ask this question is, can you give me, like, I don't want all these solutions, but at the same time, I don't want just one. I, I want to be able to choose from a bunch of solutions. So I think this was, um, uh, this as an idea has been around for a while, but I think it was 
codified and fairly thoroughly studied in a recent HKI paper, maybe 2020, I think, by, uh, by a group of people who sort of uh, actually gave a fairly generic framework for coming up with diverse solutions for various um, uh, for various problems when parameterized by the structural parameter called Trevert. So they sort of had a meta approach to this, which was explained through vertex cover, which is everybody's, well, at least in the parameterized world, that's everybody's favorite problem. But then it was kind of generalized in a way that you could plug and play and get a DP-based algorithm for finding a diverse array of solutions. Um, so maybe I should be a little more specific about what I mean by a bunch of good solutions or a good bunch of solutions. So essentially you are demanding a collection of at least R solutions, which are all sufficiently different from each other. And again, depending on the problem that you're working on, depending on your solution concept, you may have various notions of distance. And you could also demand that every pair of solutions is at least d apart, or you could demand that the total distance when calculated over all pairs of solutions is at least some target. So this is usually what it means for a collection of solutions to be diverse. The idea is that they're sufficiently different from each other, right? So that's uh, that's kind of what we're looking for. And um, yeah, so I think the, um, uh, so, so uh, the result that I wanted to talk about a little bit at least was uh, from, again, this relatively recent uh, paper titled Diversity in Chemini Rank Aggregation, uh, where you're essentially asking for not just one consensus ranking, but a bunch of them, which are all sufficiently different from each other, say with respect to the usual kendall tau distance that we have been talking about. So um, they actually work with a, a problem called the completion ordering problem, which should be quite reminiscent of what we just did with weighted feedback offset. So here, the idea is that you have a bunch of elements and you're given a bunch of ordered pairs. And uh, so that's a partial order that you're already given. I think it respects, um, it respects transitivity, I think. And now what you want is, um, yeah, so, so what you want is an extension of this partial order to a linear order that has minimum cost, right? And the way cost is defined is that for all the pairs that are not present, for every ordered pair that's not already present, you are given a cost of including that pair in your, in your linear order. So, um, there's something called the positive completion ordering problem, which is this restricted version where these costs must be strictly positive, whereas in completion ordering, you're allowed to have some of these costs being zero. And you can probably already see what this has to do with Kemeny rank aggregation. So you have your, you know, you, you have the rankings. And what you do is, well, I mean, if if there is a pair that is unanimous, you just add that in as a, as a fixed pair. So for instance, everybody likes the cake over the donut. So we know that we want our consensus ranking. Um, uh, so so uh, the, the Kemeny consensus is unanimous. It doesn't make sense to disturb unanimity. And that's hopefully reasonably intuitive. So you throw these unanimous pairs in as the, as the fixed pairs that you want to respect. And for every other pair, you kind of know the cost of adding. So for instance, the cost of adding uh, a burger preferred over a pizza is four because that's how many people uh, that are there that don't agree with that. And uh, the cost of adding the pair the other way around is just one and so on. So you add all of these costs and um, you know, you end up with an instance of, of the completion ordering problem. So, uh, so, so the Kemeny rank aggregation problem reduces to completion ordering. And uh, what's done in this paper is that they come up with an algorithm parameterized by the path width of the co-comparability graph of this partial order row that's developed from the unanimous pairs. So the co-comparability graph is well, the comparability graph is just essentially the partial order. You have all the edges corresponding to the pairs that you have. And the co-comparability graph is, you can think of it as being the complement of this graph, right? And the path width is, um, okay, um, yeah, I think this is a picture I've stolen from Wikipedia to show you what path width means. I don't think it's necessary to... Um, worry about the definition if it's a definition you haven't seen before, but just think of it as a measure of 
how close an arbitrary graph is to looking like a path, right? And um, uh, it does have several, uh, you know, nice nice properties and there's several nice ways of saying this. I'm kind of doing this a little bit of injustice here, but in the interest of time, I won't get into um, what path width is about, but I will say that um, uh, one of the uh, like nice technical tools in, um, in, in the algorithm that's given here is uh, to establish that you can actually come up with a, with a path decomposition for the co-compatibility graph of a partial order that is in some sense consistent with the partial order itself. So if the partial order um, has a certain pair, uh, then that pair has a nice behavior with respect to the path decomposition. So if the partial order says A is greater than B, then um, I believe uh, the consistency guarantees you that the the interval for the bags containing A does not end before the intervals for the bags that contain B. Uh, I could have potentially said that the other way around, but but there is a natural notion of consistency uh, that is exhibited by, uh, or it is shown that you can come up with a nice path decomposition. Well, again, the word nice is used in a slightly different way, but um, okay, the correct thing to say here is that you can come up with a consistent path decomposition and that actually ends up making the dynamic programming algorithm very convenient. I did have a couple of slides showing a little bit of how the DP works, but I ended up censoring it out because I did anticipate that we will not be able to get to it, but I will advertise the running time here, which is, but it's some function of, uh, you know, various things I should, probably at least tell you what all these symbols are. N and M are simply the number of voters and candidates. Uh, w is the width. Um, R is the number of things that you're looking for. Um, D is the diversity. That's the, that's the total amount of distance they want between the solutions. And that these parameters, delta and S, and I hope I didn't mix up the symbols, but delta and S are parameters that control some sort of a quality threshold. So if you, if you, uh, so, so, so they actually solve a slightly more general problem where you're allowed to uh, give up a little bit on the um, on the optimality of the consensus rankings to be able to get our rankings that are actually sufficiently different from each other. So, so you you sort of have a tolerance like a quality tolerance threshold that you can control, and uh, that's uh, that's that's where some of these other parameters are coming in. But but overall, this is. Uh, you think of this as essentially being um, FPT in the number of solutions that you're looking for and um, uh, the, the diversity and the path width, right? So that's uh, that's that's one of the main things um, that, that came up. And also, um, it turns out that the partial completion, uh, sorry, the positive completion ordering problem, uh, which is actually more general than Kemeny rank aggregation, um, had so far algorithms of the form uh, k to the k, where k is again uh, sort of the cost of completing the ordering. And um, uh, another thing that's that's shown here is um, is that you can improve the k to the k to some uh, k to the root k to two to the root k, uh, which is the kind of running time that you already have for special cases like Kamini rank aggregation because of the connections with uh, fast and so on. So, uh, so they do generalize. Um, they do generalize that to PCO, which I think is uh, sort of nice to know. Okay, so on that note, and I mean, I just in the nick of time, I think uh, I will stop by saying that uh, CARE is a fundamental problem that's, that's also fun. It has nice connections with these graph algorithms. That's very well studied uh, from both the approximation and parameterized lines of work. And I think it's probably a good time to see if uh, there's, there's plenty of, uh, uh, so, so it is a hard problem as we saw, it's like NP hard even in a very restricted setting and so on. So, um, so th there's definitely a lot of context for trying to see if you can do better if you look at combining the parameterized and approximation approaches, which is something that's being done a lot lately, but I'm not aware of that being done specifically for Kemeny rank aggregation. So I'd throw that as like one sort of, I think, uh, fairly interesting direction for further work. And of course the diversity work is fairly recent. And I uh, I think that while the path width of the co-compatibility graph is interesting, uh, for sure, I, I, I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of understanding this parameter better, because I think it's it's a parameter that's small, again, for homogeneous, um, uh, so, so at least that's, that's my intuition right now. 
that you would want the co-compatibility graph to be sparse, which means you would want the compatibility graph to be dense, which means you expect a lot of unanimous pairs. So, so this works well when the rankings are fairly similar to each other. Would be interesting to see, um, you know, uh, what would be other things that that make sense. Uh, so there, there are a lot of parameters that I didn't talk about, like closeness to single peakness and things like that. Um, uh, which, which I think would be also fairly relevant for for the Kemeny rank aggregation problem. All right, sorry for going uh, ever so slightly over time, but I think I will stop here. And uh, if any comments or questions, uh, that that would be good at this point. I think. Okay, I see that there is a question in the chat. Uh, do, do you want me to take that first? Yes, yes, please. Okay, all right. Sorry, I think I, I should have caught this at the time that it came in. Uh, what does an equivalent instance mean? Does it mean having the same optimal value as the original problem? I don't remember in which context I talked about the instances being equivalent, but if it was in the context of any of these reductions that we did from feedback headset to KRA or uh, from KRA to, uh, to FAST or to completion ordering, in all cases, uh, the, the equivalence basically means that, uh, yeah, this, this instance has a uh, Kemeny consensus ranking with a certain cost, if and only if the graph back there or the CO instance out there has a solution whose cost is, um, uh, whose cost is typically, again, actually just K again, uh, but in general, it would be some function of K. But but for the reductions that we did, I think the costs turn out to be exactly the same. Oh, okay, on the kernelization slide, yeah, okay. So uh, for kernelization, yes, so equivalent would be the traditional notion of equivalence where you say that the, the instance that you obtain as the output of the kernelization algorithm is a yes instance if and only if, so this is all for decision problems. So it's a yes instance, if and only if the instance that you started out with was a yes instance. So, um, so okay, so the, we, we are talking about decision problems in the, in the classical notion of kernelization, but um, since you mentioned optimal values, as I said, lossy kernels is a more modern uh, class of definitions, which, which accounts for also, uh, extending the kernelization approach for, for optimization problems. Um, I'm pretty sure I will not get the details of the definition right, but they, they do have some sort of a way of translating uh, the optimals and this, uh, uh, the optimal solution. The, the, the idea with lossy kernelization is that you allow for the optimal uh, to, to actually um, uh, 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 to, to actually change a little bit, but not by too much. And uh, you have, I think it's not enough to just have the kernelization algorithm. You also need a companion. I think they call it a solution lifting algorithm or something like that. So it takes a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, extra terminology to be able to talk about kernelization for optimization problems. But that is something that, that, uh, um, uh, that, that at least as a notion definitely exists in the literature at this point. But that's that's not what I was talking about on that slide. So those were decision problems and the equivalence is just the boring notion of equivalence where, yeah, that's uh, hopefully that addresses your question. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, so I had a question regarding, so you uh, mentioned uh, there's a PTAS for uh, Feedback oxidant rate. Um, yeah, feedback oxidant tournaments, weighted feedback oxidant tournaments, correct. Yeah, so was that an EPTAS? E because that would directly imply an FPT algorithm, I suppose, right? Uh, yeah, it would. I. Uh, it's a good point. I don't remember if it was an EPTAS off the top of my head. I think not, but uh, but yeah, you'll have to allow me to. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can go back and look at that paper, but yeah. Uh, that's that's a good point. I think the the point here, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if the EPTAS would imply the kind of sub exponential FPT algorithms that are known at the right. moment. But uh, but yeah, and and also if we, yeah, I'm not sure about the weighted version. But for the unweighted version, the the thing about branching on triangles gives you a fairly intuitive um, uh, reason for believing that the problem is FPT in the solution size. 
but yeah i think um yeah it's, it's a good point i mean you would you would get it by a direct implication unfortunately i don't remember off the top of my head uh, what the running time was but it's a good point and we can we can look it up yeah right and uh, one more question regarding the run time it's two raised to uh, root of some k right correct so that that is allowed because k can be at most n square and um, that would yeah yeah that's that's a good point i mean this is a slightly sneaky choice of parameter in some sense if you like uh because um you know typically for for most optimization problems you have some concept of the size of the object and usually your optimal value is at most the size of that object but in this case the gemini score can be as as bad as uh, n squared like you're pointing out um uh but in this case yeah i mean i think the the idea is that you already given up on n as a parameter and um i'm i'm not sure if the fact that the parameter can grow as large as or can can be quadratic in the number of candidates gives you some intuition for why you would expect a sub exponential time algorithm but i'm pretty sure like i don't have an example of the top of my head but the the fact that the parameter is large will not uh, definitely will not guarantee or imply Uh, I'm not even sure if it gives you hope for a sub-exponential uh, algorithm necessarily, uh, but yeah, this may be one way of saying that. Okay, um, all right. And in practice, uh, okay, square root of opt is still going to be potentially as bad as uh, linear in n um, if if k is bad. So you so you so you might argue that okay, I'm I'm not. i'm not as impressed as i would be if it was a uh, sub exponential in a smaller parameter so so that i agree but the parameter being uh, being large or being quadratic in some natural notion of size of instance uh, probably uh, so again as i said i don't have a concrete example to show that th- so so there, there is there are a lot of eth and seth based hardness results which rule out sub exponential time algorithms for a variety of problems I would not be surprised if some of those involved parameters that were similarly large, but you still don't have sub-exponential time algorithms for them. So I hope that helps. Right, and uh, what if you had put a restriction on the size of the Kamini score, like only in instances where it's let's say little yeah. of n square or something? Maybe that's an interesting direction. Yeah, yeah, I yeah that 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 would be interesting. I'm not sure. If, like, so there's been a fair amount of experimental work that's been done, like in this kind of literature. So, um, and uh, that's work that I'm not super familiar with. So I'm not sure if there's something known from that that line of research. But um, yeah, a lot of the kernelization uh, arguments are driven by the fact that okay, I mean, you have a budget for the Kamini score, and that is k. in principle k can be as bad as n squared can be as good as zero uh, but we are going to say that we have a working budget of k so often what the kernelization algorithms will do is they will they will look at the uh, you know the, the, they will look at the rankings and they'll say there's so much drama going on here there's no way that you're going to get a consensus ranking uh, that's uh, that has a cost of at most k so just throw it out as an instance so so having that uh, k as a parameter gives you that flexibility so like we said if you have a ranking and you have its opposite um you are committed to a kemini score of n choose to no matter what you do uh, at at a very minimum if you have a pair of rankings like that so if k is less than n choose to just you know you just throw it out like that's uh, m choose to um in, in m being the number of candidates so uh, so yeah let's say you had a bunch of rankings which were sigma and then uh, you know n by 2 rankings over sigma and n by 2 rankings that were sigma reversed then you already know that if k is like uh, if k is not sufficiently large there's no hope so the kernelization would just have the liberty to throw out these instances and say we don't care like these are these are easy no no instances because you're on a tight budget so that's that's what drives a lot of the kernelization arguments uh, but yeah i like specifically looking at k in terms of m i think would would definitely be an interesting thing to do so would you say it might be possible that the problem is not in and we had any more for let's say a, a slightly lesser size of k um okay so um right you could argue that if k is like a, a like 
yeah, I don't know if that's implied by the kernels automatically, but yeah, I mean, the, the FPT algorithms will tell you that it's polynomial for a fixed key, right? So uh, to that extent, um, yes, I think even for values of k, like let's say up to log square n, I guess, uh, the FPT algorithm will kind of fizzle out and become polynomial. So, so yes, it's, it's not hard for small values of k in that sense. Uh, for sure. And um, again, the intuition is that the small value of K restricts you so much that, that you can, um, you can, I mean, either easily determine that it's a no instance or, or figure it out. But yeah, this is something that's more, it's, it's a more generic thing. If you have a FPT running time, you can reverse engineer typically for up to what value of k can you push your luck and that FPT running time will actually be polynomial. So with two to the square root of opt something like up to log square and should be good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I will just like make a follow up remark to say that sometimes people also look at the dual parameterization. So based on what you said, I'm also thinking about like, similarly, can you say that if opt is really large, like, so if I give you a very uh, luxurious budget, very liberal case, you know, uh, pretty close to its maximum possible value, then you probably have an abundance of yes instances as well, because K is so liberal, you can probably also, so, so the dual parameterization would be something like, so the absolute maximum Kemeny score is something, let's call it T. So can you come up with a consensus ranking whose score is like at least K less than T, right? So I don't want to suffer all the way up to T. Can you give me a little bit of a saving? And that saving is codified as K. So, um, so again, dual parameterization is a pretty common concept. I don't remember seeing it uh, being a, like, yeah, I, I could have missed something, but I don't. I, I don't remember seeing dual parameterizations being studied for Kemeny. So based on what you said, I think that could also be another interesting question potentially. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay. If not. Uh... Uh, maybe we can uh, give a round of applause for uh, the nice talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. I mean, um, it was a pleasure being here and apologies for running slightly over time, but uh, it, was, it was wonderful uh, being here and uh, hopefully see you at ISC sometime in person. Yeah. Of course, the pleasure is ours. Uh, yeah. So I'm stopping the recording at this point of time. <laughs>